Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Um, I call this order. Welcome to the semi-final of the Championship of 2010. Uh, on the next to this round, we have two of the more. Uh, and we can we go. Uh, all the time is normal. Uh, and so we're going to do five of the judges are all ready to go. Do nothing if you're ready. Okay. I invite Adam to find the two of the seven in the Okay, everybody, listen very carefully to my case construct. Okay, so what we're going to argue today on this side of the house is that the Kaaba in Mecca should be open to all people of the book, and I will explain what that means. So the Kaaba is basically Islam's Vatican. It's in Mecca and Saudi Arabia. What we're arguing is that Muslim clerics should advocate that it's open to all people of the book, which are a special section of people who follow the Abrahamic religions according to Islam. It's in the Quran that these are the people of the book. These are Christians and Jews, the Abrahamic faith, that were monotheists who came before Islam, have special protections in the Quran. You're not allowed to convert them in theory when you take over and invade their lands. They have special protections. And this is a monotheist site that predates Islam. It was built by the Hanis, Abraham and his sons, before Judaism even existed. It's the first monotheistic shrine in the world. All the Hanis believed was that there was one God. This eventually became Judaism. So we see the Muslims, Christians, and Jews are all Hanis. The reason why it became a Muslim shrine was, eventually, in the time of Muhammad, it became a pagan shrine and was the, you know, was the temple for pagan gods. Muhammad went in, took it over, made it monotheist once again, and it's in Saudi Arabia where typically Muslims live. At the moment, no people who aren't Muslim have access to this place. We're going to say that they should be given access, that Muslim clerics should advocate for this policy, that they should lobby for this policy, that this is a good thing, but we're going to make one exception, not at Hajj time, because this is a special thing for Islam, where they have you know, a special connection to it at Hajj time, and there's too many who want to come at Hajj time. For the rest of the year, because it's not as time sensitive, some Muslims do go and visit, but we think that it wouldn't be like a huge danger to have all the people in the book have access to it then. Okay, so into my first point. First of all, we think that this makes sense given the historical background of the Kaaba. What is the Kaaba? It is a shrine to a monotheistic god. It is essentially a shrine to all people who believe there is one god. And yes, it took on historical importance in Islam when Muhammad took it over and then decided to center his religion in Mecca. But it doesn't actually change the historical importance for Christians and Jews, for whom this was their original shrine, their first shrine to believing in one god, which is something that all Christians, Jews, and Muslims have in common, this belief in one Abrahamic god. So we think this, on a historical level, it makes sense for Muslim clerics to recognize this and to say, you know, if this was the original purpose, let's reinstate it and bring it back to what it is. But furthermore, on a theological level, we think Muslim clerics should actually advocate this policy. Why? Because I talked to you about the people of the book, right? You have protections in Islam for Christians and Jews. You are, in theory, not allowed to convert them. And in most Muslim empires that actually take this seriously, you see, for years and years and years, they did not convert Christians or Jews because of that. I point you to the Ottoman Empire before, like, 1913, where Jews and Christians lived very, very safely for years and years and years because they were people of the book. They were not converted. Their churches and their synagogues were allowed to exist in peace. We say on a theological level, Islam has never been one of those religions that forces conversion and actually respects that different people will believe in one God differently. And so for these reasons, we think on a theological level, it makes sense for clerics to go back and respect what's in the Quran. Yes? Isn't the mere stepping on this line a serious infraction of the people of Like just stepping on it if you're not Muslim? Well, no, I, we don't agree with that because we think the people of the book are not allowed to convert them. We think it's Abrahamic religions. We're not letting in like a Buddhist. We're saying people of the book, right? So it's actually just a different thing. So that's not actually true. And if people do believe that, it's more of a fundamentalist belief that we actually want to spell on the side of the house. Okay. So the next point I want to talk to you about is how this is a good faith diplomatic gesture. So this is my IR point. So what's the biggest problem with Islam here today? What's one of the big problems? One of the big problems is there isn't a lot of sympathy towards Islam because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of Sort of belief that this is like a religion full of you know people who are more likely to be extreme and don't really respect other religions okay so we think this is a gesture that shows actually we're emphasizing the people of the book we're emphasizing the built-in protections for people of different faiths and we're letting you come to a shrine that you actually have a historical and theologically claim over 
playing over. So we think it has a huge symbolic importance, even if not huge numbers of people who go. But furthermore, we think large numbers of people will go. In particular, Middle Eastern Christians, who are maybe closer to the Kaaba than the Vatican, would want to make this type of a pilgrimage. Middle Eastern Christians don't really have, you know, sort of like a place to go at the moment that is like the center of their religion, um, you know, in the same way, just because, you know, when Turkey like got rid of like church. Anyway, so, like, so we think that a lot of Middle Eastern Christians will go, and we think a lot of people around the world would actually go if they thought that they could go, right? We think that this would happen, and this would be on a symbolic level important. Because we think that one of the big issues in Islam right now is ensuring, in terms of Israel, that you have access to sites you share with the Jews, right? Like the Temple Mount. So if you want to have access to things like the Temple Mount, the Jews typically that the Jews claim that they have a more significant claim over than the Muslims, we think that this is a good bargaining chip to say, listen, we'll actually share with you. We think this improves sympathy with other people in the world to try to, like, it's a good PR campaign. So if the Jews, like, restrict your access to the Temple Mount in Israel, or if Israel, like, isn't going to play ball with you, you can say, look, we actually are very tolerant of Judaism and Christianity, so we think we get more people on side, that's really important. Not right now, so it's a good faith diplomatic gesture to do this and to allow access. Yeah. But furthermore, okay, thank you. So why at this point do you refuse access to Hindus or other versions of Christians uh, that also could benefit from this version? I mean, like, basically what we're arguing is that this is a religious shrine. I'm for it, people of the Abrahamic faith. We think this is one of the reasons why they want to worship the same god, and it would be sacrilege if people came there and worshiped a different god or were called to So we think that that's important. We think that there is a theological and historical justification for this, and if you recognize that, that's moderate enough without bastardizing the purpose of the time. So that's really important and to acknowledge. But finally, I want to talk to you about a PR campaign of demystification. It's not just a bargaining chip, but it's really important that people actually see the cop. One of the reasons why it's so easy to paint Islam as a scary religion that's full of fundamentalists is because people don't understand it. It's not like what well, it's not like with Catholicism, right? I can go to St. Peter's as an Anglican, I can see it, and I can understand that it's not a scary secret club where people are like, you know, torturing young girls in like the back room. I can have access to it. I know that like if there's not a bookie monster in there, right? I see that they worship, I see how it happens, I see pilgrimages. It doesn't infringe their ability to worship, but it actually enhances my understanding and it makes me less frightened of them. We think one of the real reasons why there's so much discrimination towards Muslims is that people don't even know what it's about. You see a lot of misbeliefs like women don't go to heaven in Islam, and women aren't really respected. But when you see that women can go to the Kaaba and actually worship in the Kaaba, we think it goes a long way to dispel that myth. When you have non-Muslims going, saying, I came back, I saw what it was like, it wasn't weird. People were worshiping God, they were praying, there were women there as well. And it actually shows me that it was, as a modern practice, that there isn't this fear and it's not seen as the secret club that I can't gain access to. So because of demystification, because of the fact that it's a good faith diplomatic gesture and bargaining chip, because it's theologically consistent with Islam, because it's historically consistent with Islam, we think Muslim clerics should advocate that Kaaba should be open to all people of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for the remarks and invite the member officers to open the chat up in the beginning of seven minutes.
for a fundamentalist religion um, that doesn't uh, that doesn't respect the religions of other people, not only those of Abrahamic religions, but in particular, I think the particularly salient one here uh, to talk about is Hinduism, given sort of the, the, the historical problems between Pakistan and India. So we think that um, allowing people access, allowing people of any religion access to the shrine demonstrates that Islam, um, that people who are Muslim do have a respect for people of all religions, um, do understand that um, worship is, is something that they have in common. It creates this commonality between people of all religions, which we think is generally going to be beneficial um, for Muslims everywhere um, and for the very religion of Islam. We think that um, the purpose of the shrine um, for Muslims is to worship there. But the purpose of the shrine for the Jews and Christians who would be going there would not be to worship there, right? They're not going to be, are you okay, uh, actually? Uh, just answer this, are you okay with people worshiping Christ in the Kaaba? Yes, because what you're worshiping is monotheism. That's the thing. All people in the book are protected, not pagan god worshippers necessarily in the Kaaba. Well, the thing is, nobody's going to go to the Blue Mosque. A Jew isn't going to go to the Blue Mosque, or to go to the Kaaba, talk with the Blue Mosque later, and worship Allah, right? They're going to worship their own conception of God, which is very, very different from the Muslim conception of God. We think that in particular, Christianity is very, very different from uh, Islam, just in a few fundamental ways. You have another figure, um, uh, and another object of worship, you have Jesus Christ, Mr. Speaker, who isn't really um, exactly, who is in some sense is God, but is not exactly the same as God. He's worshipped as God in Christianity. He's not worshipped as a God in Judaism or in Islam. We think that that is, um, that he's, he's, he's sort of understood as a prophet, but not as part of God. We think that's a pretty fundamental difference. We think it would actually be kind of sacrilegious to go to the Kaaba and worship Jesus Christ there. We think that the reason that people actually go to these shrines is to gain a better understanding of the historical background of the religion, to gain a better understanding of what their religion entails, what it is like to see people of another religion worship. So I'll bring up the example of the Blue Mosque. People go to the Blue Mosque not to worship there if they're from another religion, but to see it, to see what it looks like, um, to sort of gain an understanding of the place of its history, of the people who worship there. We think that that's incredibly valuable. Um, and that opening up the, the opening up the Kaaba in this way will actually sort of create a better sense of understanding, not only as sort of an extension of good faith on the part of Muslims, but also in terms of the kind of enlightenment that people are going to get from getting from going there. Yes. And we think it's certainly possible to respectfully go there if you're a pagan. You're not going to worship there, right? You just want to see what it's like. You just want to understand what that other religion is like and respect the people who are worshiping there. So uh, we think that uh, furthermore, I'd like to talk about this sort of strange false dichotomy they've created between these Abrahamic religions and other and other religions. So we think that they, they, they may seem as though there is a direct historical lineage that has had no influence, no outside influence, that all of these Abrahamic religions are sort of one concrete whole, sort of a direct descendants from one to another. But what we actually see, Mr. Speaker, is that there is a lot of influence um, from different religions upon these religions. So there's a lot of influence from like Zoroastrianism on Judaism. There's a lot of influence in particular because of their historical ties, because of the fact that they lived on the same land. There's a lot of influence of Hinduism and Hindu practices and sort of some certain Hindu beliefs um, and Hindu acts onto the Islamic religion. And we think that that, uh, that historical tie is something that it would be very valuable for Muslims to recognize, particularly because if we're talking about this idea of creating more a more modern Islam, a more accepting Islam, it would be incredibly valuable to create a more a, a, an Islam that is more accepting of Hinduism because of all the problems that we see between India and Pakistan, the fact that they've been um, you know, at nuclear standoff before, um, the fact that those people are actually the same people, just separated by a religion, they do a lot of the same things. Um, we think that that is something that would be very valuable for Islam to recognize, for Muslim clerics to recognize in this case. So what did they talk about on their side? They talked about how uh, you have all these sort of, you have this sort of, uh, this column of 
Abrahamic religions that are very different from other religions. We don't think that's entirely true. We think there's a lot more blending at the edges, different sects of this, uh, different sects of Islam that are much closer to Hinduism, different sects of Hinduism that are much closer to Islam in a lot of ways. A lot of Muslims um, in India, for instance, won't eat cows because they respect the, the beliefs of their neighbors. A lot of Hindus um, in Pakistan aren't going to eat pigs because they respect those particular beliefs. We think that um, this sort of, the, they've talked about the value of this shrine as the first shrine for believing in one God. We think that that is an incredibly important historical significance and that it would be very valuable for everybody to have access to that information. Particularly, I don't know, just sort of as a side note, if you're interested in converting people, that might be a good thing. Um, but we also think that um, this idea that it would be a great bargaining chip with Israel and for other religions is something that we can extend to religions like Hinduism um, to create a better image of Islam around the world. We're proud to propose. I think, Professor Austin, very much for the remarks of like, this for the time. Saying that even though the Quran is very clear that infidels 
cannot enter these areas, that these are sacrosanct, that this is like sort of the equivalent of letting non-Jews into the inner temple in each synagogue, that this is something that just cannot happen, right? That are even like non-rabbis into the inner temple. Or, or you could say Mormons, right? But they have certain temples that they don't allow non-believers into. What they're now advocating on their side is, we should do this. Like, we should just, like, anyone who wants to should be able to go somewhere where your book says, this is absolutely not allowed. We think that this is a recipe for taking an unstable religion and making it more unstable. By taking a religion that's sort of premised on the idea of keeping a strong hierarchy. And this is the case in most, like, main forms of, of Islam, is that, that you have this strong hierarchy, that this hierarchy sort of was keeping people together. You know. We're undermining that by saying that, no, now we need to have a major schism between people who feel that Islam should basically take a totally like sort of relativist you know, approach or interpretive approach to the Quran that is no longer the real and true word of God. That it's sort of like a guideline that you follow. We think on our side of the house that it's great that in large parts Christianity has become that way. That a lot of Christians are now very tolerant because of the fact that they feel that the Bible is not something that always has to be taken literally. But we don't see at all how this is something that can happen overnight with Islam. And we think that advocating this is excessively dangerous. Are Jews and Christians infidels too? Not if you look at the Quran. Not if you look at all the analysis. So let's get right into that in detail. Okay, so they said, we have given a false dichotomy. There's no connection between Jews and Christians and Muslims. And I'll pause it to you, maybe Jews think that. But Muslims don't, because the Quran, like, Muslims think the Quran is like the same thing as what Christians think the New Testament is to the Old Testament. They're all the same book, it's three volumes. This works really, like, this would be really problematic to feed to a Jew, because they're like, oh, we don't care about the books that came after this, they're fake. Muslims think the Old Testament's real, they think the New Testament's real, they think Jesus was a prophet, they think Abraham was a prophet. They recognize all these things, they're incorporated into the Quran. The Quran literally says, as Sarah gave you analysis of, you're not allowed to try to convert Jews, you're not allowed to try to convert Christians, because fundamentally they believe in the same God as you, and if you hang in there, they'll come around to it, right? It's all different paths to the same God. This is not the case with Hindus. This is not the case with Buddhists. This is not the case with anyone who is not a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim, right? So they are all part of the same religion. That's what makes this a reasonable, approachable, small step. This is why this works as a way to open the door to a diversity and understanding within Islam. We think that Islam has a long way to go beyond what we're advocating here today. But we think that this is the appropriate step to move Islam forward. We think that this is the only step, one of the only steps, to move Islam forward. And for these reasons, we, oh wait, hold on, I have one more thing I want to talk about, so I've got a little more time. This India-Pakistan thing. I really don't think that this is like the best example that could be used. One, we think that we have like way more analysis on our side of the house about how this impacts Middle Eastern religions rather than India and Pakistan. But I also want to sort of just highlight the fact that in reality, the India and Pakistan problems, you sort of use religion as sort of a cover for the cope, like the racism, right? And the political issues that separate these two groups. It was political issues that caused the original separation. And it continues to be political issues like Kashmir that sort of start these things. Because the BJP sort of uses religion as a covert racism, doesn't mean that like this will solve us. For these reasons, we stand in proud proposition. Okay, thank you, speaker, for the remarks. And if I can lead the opposition, you uh, can kind of
or what is written inside your particular religious document, be the Bible, be the Quran in this case. Uh, why this matters is, uh, so the Quran has a number of things uh, written in it, uh, and it's not that everything is taken at face value, right? So, I mean, the Quran also has this weird thing about the, the caliphs and like, how they're like legal scholars, and there's like two different traditions, but I don't know enough about it, nor is that really that relevant. Uh, what matters is, uh, is that there are a number of texts, for example, that say different things about, for example, uh, who is an infidel and who is not an infidel, right? Um, so, uh, why this matters is, for example, if you use the monotheist standard, for example, if you were to, for example, read original Vedic texts, Hindus are monotheistic, right? Because Hindus claim that all gods are one god. Uh, so, I mean, like, if you want to deal with textual interpretation, that's one way you can interpret a text. The same way that there is there's issues of textual interpretation of, for example, which particular Islamic practice is coming from not. Like, is it is this in fact actually the case that we ought to uh, destroy a population, right? I mean, there's a term for uh, takfir, right? That's the one where it's like you have to go in. Uh, and, but there's like different branches on what is it. Like, I mean, that's like the Wahhabist versus non wahhabist battles. And why this matters, right? Is that these are a number of textual divides that determine that Muslim clerics end up talking about and trying to figure yeah. out. Uh, so what we say that it's better for Muslim clerics to advocate that it is that in this particular case you should not let all people have access to the site. This is not radically inconsistent with Islamic policy, with, with ways in which we view Islam, right? I mean, some branches of Wahhabism say that you should never let anybody who's not a Muslim inside of any mosque, uh, but that clearly isn't the case, right? We allow people to enter those mosques. We allow for a number of moderate ways in which we can allow people to have access to sites, particularly when they're historical sites, and I'll give you reasons why we think that's really important. Uh, but we think this is a reason that we can emphasize one particular. Now, Rudy comes up and his point is, well, look, you're going to have different schisms or different levels of schisms. Now, one, I think when it comes to advocating policies, I think it's, it's, it's all right to not to, to pursue policies that some people may choose as more extreme than others. I don't think it's that extreme either. Secondly, uh, as far as schisms in Islam go, there are few. There are few that are much greater than anything that we're proposing today. I mean, that is the actual sincere battle between Wahhabists in North Africa and non-Wahhabists in North Africa. It's a battle between very extreme interpretations of the Quran text and non-extreme yeah. versions of the Quranic text. We think it's perfectly acceptable to argue that clerics should, in fact, advocate this more broader version. Of it. So then the question is: Is it all right to do that? What do we gain by doing that? So I think what you do is you open up the. The reason why you want to open up these sites to as many people as possible is you want to broaden a historical situation where other people can claim to have understanding of that religion, have access to this. This is kind of a part of Sarah's point, is, right? Um, but I think that this matters also for developing bonds between different religious groups or groups that claim to have very distinct differences between them, right? Uh, so the more access you have to these sites, the more ways in which you highlight the historicity of those sites, right? You make you point out that Islam is part of a broader context. Of, of developments of different individuals, religions in that, in that area. I mean, you point out things like you know, uh, where Muhammad came from. You put, look at the, the large number of relationships that monotheism historically has had with Hindu texts. You talk about the number of associations that we have in a variety of religious spheres, right? Why does that matter? Because I think that means that we actually get better dealings with a lot of religious violence problems that happen. They are, like, I mean, uh, we all think about Israel and Palestine, but if you want to talk about where the most anti, uh, where the most Muslim violence ends up happening, it's in the backwaters of, of, of Indian states, where the world's largest population of Muslims exist, uh, where there's all sorts of ethnic violence and sectarian violence that occurs between those two groups. If what you're caring about is trying to deal with how many Muslims are getting in trouble and trying to deal with ways in which you can deal with helping Islam in its, in its broader sphere, I think these are situations that you want to care about. Yes, sir. Why do you think opening the Kaaba would solve the Indian-Pakistan issue? Read told you it's not about okay, it, like uh, I mean, like you think it's going to solve Israel-Palestine, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, like what, what we have to recognize is that all these things are small gestures and small steps that we think we can move forward in a number of disputes. What we're saying is that I think you're excluding particular parts that need to be really important. Why do we think that the exclusion of these groups also is really important, is really damaging, right? Because it's not that you're really accepting those Abrahamic people as as being Jewish and Christian, right, under this, right? Is you're advocating them, them basically being Muslim. Like, they're basically Muslim. There's, you know, a couple issues here and there, and history, a couple wrong turns, and, you know, but pretty much, but pretty much, right, they're on the right path, right? Uh, why does that matter? Because you don't really get any sort of claim of understanding of those other religions, no real claim of any of the sort of religious benefits that I think their side wants, when all you're doing is re renaming a group that, renaming a group, but not recognizing the difference. Right? Because it's not like those Christians are less Christian now. It's not like those Jews are less Jewish now. You just say, 
they're not really, it's not like they just still worship our God, so it's fine. But that doesn't deal with any of the areas of conflict that happen with people, which is when you think they're a different God, and when you act on those things, right? So if you're like, well, they are and they aren't, well, then it doesn't really solve the problem that you're trying to deal with there, right? All you're doing is saying, well, there's some good Jews and some bad Jews, but that already is the case, right? Rather, it would be better to say, well, there is a long history of this site that we think everyone should have access to, right? There also is a further problem when you try and, try and isolate what we think are Abrahamic faith from non Abrahamic faith, is I think in some sense you also change battlegrounds in some important areas, right? So you're like, okay, maybe now, you know, in uh, uh, yeah, uh, where there's all the, uh, that's also the next spot, uh, where, where, a lot of, uh, where a lot of Indian Jews are as well, right? Uh, you may be like, okay, we're fine with those, but we still want to fight the Hindus, right? Like, you have to just create a different divide at best is what you get. And you still get those sorts of areas of conflict. I believe it's something called othering um, that often happens, which apparently is the point, so I'll take it. Uh, so what this case comes down to in my uh, rebuttal lesson? Okay, so uh, what they seem to claim, their claim has to be the following, right? What? We are only accept Abrahamic faith into this particular religious sect, right? And to that we had a couple of few responses, right? First, we're like, well, we open religious sites, especially when they have historical importance, to any number of people in any number of situations, right? And we do have ways in which we regulate and moderate that, right? So when you go to the Blue Mosque, you know, you're asked to wear something covering your hair. You're not allowed to go into particular parts inside, like, you know, you, there's like a little wall, maybe the kids are playing past it, but you still have to go past it, right? Uh, but we let, we let people have access to it. That's crucial because then it makes it look less scary, right? I mean, if you care about less scariness, then we get it on either side. The second thing that we said is like, look, as far as these are textual questions, we think there is meaningful things inside the text that suggest that Islam also says, you know, it's not clearly that everyone is an infidel. I mean, there are, there are things about uh, conversions, but I mean, those apply to, to a number of groups, right? Um, but I mean, in fact, conversions probably fall on our side. Uh, but uh, furthermore, right, that the text can also be seen to, interpret it, to be interpreted as we ought to give access to all these people in this particular limited sphere that uh, they aren't necessarily infidels. Uh, and you know, you don't want to kill people either. Uh, that's also part of Islam. Um, so I mean, you know, there's also some conflicts about that. So I think that's what's being read The next thing that they seem to make the case about is that by allowing these people in, uh, that we can get better, uh, better international gains. So this is like the, this is like the reason we should do it is for those gains. And for that, Natalia and I's first response was, it's unclear that you get those gains by merely dealing with these groups and these people, right? Uh, secondly, uh, we said that. Uh, Secondly, we said that it is unclear at all that you're even making the claim of lineage between the Abrahamic faces that Natalia talked about uh, is even as clear as what you're saying, so I think it's unclear that you get bridge those divides either. But furthermore, we said that if you actually care about meaningful Islam uh, versus non-Islam conflicts in the world, that this doesn't nearly go far enough to dealing with that, right? That we think that, for example, being able to allow uh, Christians from the United States uh, to enter, uh, you know, non non Abrahamic uh, versions of Christianity into, uh, into into this area would also be good. You know, probably matters a lot as far as dealing with Israel Palestine goes, right? If you want to talk about getting a good faith IR gesture, I, I think I, I think a better gesture is one that de uh, de religiousizes, if such a word exists, a site, but increases the historicity of a site, right? And increases then its accessibility as part of a narrative of history that all people around the world share, that is part of a, a larger movement in a number of different religions across time. I think those sorts of changes and that sort of principle change, I think is better for Isla Islamic communities insofar as they understand that they are part of a larger narrative that has those sorts of things. And secondly, uh, for these particular groups. Finally, uh, what Natalia and I said is that we think this has a lot of, this is a great policy for doing that. Our side of the house is a policy that has a much better chance of dealing with a number of other uh, Islam conflicts around the world that we think that you have to care about. Uh, it's not uh, against the rules of debate to, uh, to do this. Um, just because, I mean, if that's the case, then we lose. Uh, but uh, what we have done is we've contested, I think, a crucial part of the case. Because the case is, you should only let an Abrahamic base an Abrahamic faith will therefore help make the world better. We think you have to open it to everyone if you, in fact, want to make a better world. Uh, we are proud to oppose. Here, here. I thank you the opposition and invite the Prime Minister back on the to deliver a few minutes of our opening statement. Yeah, no. 
no more Islam. Okay. Anyway, so what are the main things that this comes down to here today? So what do we think is best for the perception of Islam in the world? And we think that all of our analysis stands, but how opening it up and demystifying it by allowing other people in does still stand. All we want to do is allow other people in where there's a justification historically and theologically so that the people who are actually worshipping there don't feel othered when there are polytheists who come there. Because as I said to you, historically, what the Muslims did was they took it back from the polytheists. We think if you allow polytheists back in, this is going to be massively unpopular with Muslims and clerics will never advocate for this. I know that I you think that Hindus are like, you know, monotheists. I'm not saying that they're not, but I'm saying it's kind of sketchy. Like, they move a lot of gods. It's hard to prove. We think a lot of Muslims are going to buy it. They're going to be like, why are there so many gods, okay? We really don't take it personally. We don't think it's really that clear. We think what you do is you make yourself look moderate by still following your faith and following the Quran and following your theology with us. Because we think the Hindus don't expect access to this particular religious site. So we don't think you're making India and Pakistan any worse. And we think it's more about land issues like Kashmir anyway, right? So we're saying there are other things you could do to have an interfaith dialogue, but they don't expect access. So all you're going to do is really piss off a lot of Muslims who are going to feel like you're letting the polytheists back in without really accomplishing a lot there. What you do on our side of the house is you have a bargaining chip for sites you actually do have a theological claim to that you share with the Jews and the Christians, like in Israel. So we think that it's better to focus on this because no, because it is theologically consistent with Islam and because we think the Jews might care about this and we think the Christians might care about this and say, you're giving us access to the Kaaba, that's a great symbolic gesture, we might actually go. That's really important. So next is like, what's tenable with Islam? I've implicitly talked about this. We think this isn't a tenable change, and they never show you why they think that clerics will actually advocate this, and people won't massively rebel. Because the difference between having all sorts of different people, all sorts of different sects of Islam who go to the Kaaba, and having in people who don't even worship Allah is like, it's all the same God. The Abrahamic God is always the same. Jesus is like related to the same God, he's the son of the same God as like Allah would be technically. All they think is it's like a logical progression and these texts are all related, they correct each other. They, all they think is the Quran is a correction of the New Testament as connected to the Old Testament. So we think Muslims, theologically speaking, there's a huge justification and an easy way to sell this to Muslims and they would buy this. But when we think all you have to do is make it like the Blue Mosque, which is owned by an incredibly secular fundamentalist country and isn't even their holiest site, we think it's not the same thing. This is the holiest site of Islam. All we're saying is take it back to its original theological historical purpose. Don't bastardize it. We think you can let more people in without letting people in that change the fundamental purpose. For all these reasons, open the cabin our way because it's reasonable and people might actually do it.